So yeah, I'm going to be talking uh, about uh, trade secret law, uh, uh, kind of an update on what's been going on. And uh, you know, in the state of Iowa now, there's basically three sources um, of law for trade secrets. Uh, there's the common law, which has kind of existed forever. Um, there is the Iowa Uniform Trade Secrets Act, which I think has been around since about 1990. And then uh, what I'm going to spend a, a good portion of today talking about uh, is the Defend Trade Secrets Act. It's a new uh, federal legislation passed uh, January of 2016, went into effect uh, May of 2016. Uh, feel free to jump in if you've got any questions at any time. Um, also, if you feel like, uh, you know, I, I do some trade secrets work, but it's not my primary focus. So if you feel like, uh, you know, I missed a case or there was uh, something I'm misstating, you know, correct me for the good of uh, the good of the cause. Um, so the uh, Defense Trade Secrets Act, uh, as I mentioned, passed uh, January of 2016 pretty much unanimously uh, passed bipartisan support. Uh, the way it was implemented, uh, a little interesting to me, um, we went in and uh, kind of amended some of the sections of uh, the trade secret criminal statute. So it's in, uh, it's in Title 18 of the federal code, in with all the, the, the criminal laws. And uh, in my materials, I sort of attached the um, the bill that implemented it, as well as the um, uh, 18 U.S.C. sections 1831 through 39, so you can kind of track what was changed and then how it fit in there. Um, from my perspective, you know, substantively, all three of those areas of law that I mentioned, uh, common law, the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, uh, which pretty much every state um, except New York has, uh, has implemented um, and the, uh, you know, the Federal Defend Trade Secrets Act. Substantively, they're all very similar. Um, so, you know, outcome determination, I don't think is, is going to be a big driver in, in whether you want to assert uh, the De Defend Trade Secrets Act or go into to state court and rely on common law um, and uh, the Uniform Trade Secrets Act. Um, I think it's it's going to be, uh, that decision is going to be driven uh, by the plaintiff, whether they want to be in federal court or not. And kind of uh, strategically, you know, the big thing it does is it gets you into federal court without having uh, diversity jurisdiction or some other sort of ancillary jurisdiction that lets you get into federal court. So you'll have to, the plaintiffs will have to decide, do we want to be doing this in state court or for some reason would I prefer to be um, in federal court. Uh, the other uh, feature we'll talk about some that, you know, when it, when it passed was uh, kind of the sexy provision or the big deal, uh, and, and I'll, we'll talk about this in some detail, is it provides for an ex parte seizure of uh, the property that embodies the trade secrets in order to prevent uh, someone from propagating those trade secrets, uh, you know, before the litigation gets a chance to get going. Um, but uh, you'll see the way it's written and the way it's been interpreted in the short time it's been around. Uh, there's very limited circumstances when that can be done. Uh, pretty much you've got to show the, um, uh, the defendant's not going to pay any attention to a regular temporary restraining order, so you need to send the marshals in and, and just take this pro property from them, take away their ability to uh, disobey the court. Um, so the, it, it went in uh, the uh, this Defend Trade Secrets Act. There was previously in uh, in the trade secret law at eighteen thirty six a provision that said the Attorney General can seek a civil injunction to enforce any violations of this title. Uh, they did away with that and uh, replaced uh, that with a civil action that can be brought by the owner of a trade secret. The owner is a, that's a defined term. It includes licensees. Um, and it, it lets uh, that person, uh, the owner, bring it for 
uh, any type of misappropriation. Uh, it needs to be uh, related to a product or service that's going to be used in interstate or foreign commerce. So that is, I guess, the one uh, slight impediment to bringing this in federal court if you wanted to. Uh, it does have to uh, involve interstate commerce, although, you know, those of us that do, I would guess a fair number in this room do uh, file, you know, federal trademark applications. Not a real high standard there, or if you remember uh, any of the cases from your constitutional law for the um, Commerce Clause cases, you, you know, you're, you're already, in order to, to uh, be interested as a trade secret, it, commerce is already involved. The, the question then is just, is it interstate or foreign? Not a real high hurdle there anymore, especially with the internet and all that. Um, and I'm going to kind of go through, you know, some of the the definitions here. I think you'll see, um, again, these kind of match up with what you always learned, uh, what were trade secrets under the common law and under the state statutes. Um, so it defines a trade secret kind of the same way the you know, the, the acts do. That is, there's certain information, and then there's... If it's, as long as it's that type of information, then we look to see, you know, did the owner take reasonable ste steps to protect the privacy, keep it secret, um, and does uh, does that information have independent economic value by virtue of being not generally known? Um, so that that first clause there that lists all the types of information, uh, that's a little more you know detailed and provides a lot more examples than than the uniform uh, code does. The uniform code pretty much just says information, including a couple different types, but not exclusively that. Um, generally, it's not much of a limitation. Again, I, you know, it's sort of difficult to imagine anything you would think of as you know having economic value that doesn't fall within that the type of information listed there in the initial clause. Uh, the uh, cases that kind of look at it of some interest maybe, they treat this first clause that's, that lists the different types of information, uh, whether something falls within that, they treat that as a question of law, kind of for the court, and then they treat these, uh, you know, A and B uh, sections uh, that's a, a question of fact then for the jury. So is there evidence one way or the other or both ways to decide whether or not they're going to, you know, going to get to a jury. Um, I underlined kind of the last uh, clause there, the uh, uh, telling who it has um, value by, by, by being um, not generally known to. Um, this, this actual uh, section here, this the definition of trade secret was uh, is not new. That was the trade the definition for trade secret used in the criminal uh, criminal uh, statute. Except that last clause used to just say uh, known by the public, and now it says another person who can obtain economic value from the disclosure or use of the information. Um, so, owner again is that's the person that uh, is entitled to bring bring a cause of action uh, to enforce this. Um, and, you know, person, of course, is, you know, that includes juristic uh, persons. Um, again, includes uh, someone who's got a license to, otherwise the rest of this is fairly um, circular, you know. The owner is someone who has the rightful legal title to. Uh, not terribly helpful, but uh, generally if um, it's someone that has taken steps to maintain the secrecy, and that secrecy is of value to them. Um, or if there's a license, if they're a licensee of someone who's doing that, they're going to have the ability to um, bring a lawsuit to for trade secret misappropriation. Uh, then you know what misappropriation is again is a defined term under the code, uh, and it matches up. Uh, pretty close. I've got some charts later on to show exactly how closely this matches up with the Uniform um, Uniform Trade Secrets Act and how it you know defines what is a misappropriation. Uh, but the first way 
uh, trade secret can, can be misappropriated is simply by acquiring the information through improper means. So you don't have to, the person uh, can be sued for and lose for misappropriation of a trade secret even if they've not uh, taken that information and, and, and put it to use or disseminated it out to other people. So, you know, simply hacking in and acquiring the information from a computer system, uh, that's enough to be considered um, a misappropriation. Uh, then sort of a second category uh, beyond acquiring it um, is uh, it's also a misappropriation to disclose or use the trade secret information. Um, and whether you just acquired it or then disclosed or used it, that, that can have some bearing, for example, on when your statute of limitations uh, starts to run. So if you, you know, if someone acquired it and then sat on it for a couple of years and then started using it, that's a separate misappropriation that then uh, would start the, the, the three-year statute of limitations going again. Um, but, uh, so the definition for that, if you disclose it or use it, first of all, if it was someone who acquired it by in, inappropriate means, if they then use it or disclose it, that's, again, another misappropriation. And then we kind of uh, move on a little bit to some uh, third parties. So if, you know, the party disclosing or using it, they themselves didn't use improper means, um, to acquire it, but they got it from someone and did, so someone, you know, uh, someone hacked in and took it, the third party gets the information from them and they know it's a trade secret, uh, and then go ahead and use it, that's a trade secret misappropriation. Um, also, and this is probably the most common, uh, the information was acquired not through improper means, it's an employee gets the information, they're entitled to the information when they get it, they didn't do anything wrong to acquire the information, but they had a duty to keep it confidential, and they breached that duty. You know, they left their employment and they uh, started using it for their own benefit, or maybe they're still employed and they sold it to someone else, uh, whatever, but even if it's acquired uh, rightfully, if it's then uh, disclosed and used when there's no, when there's a duty not to disclose it or use it, that's a misappropriation. And then the last uh, category here uh, is kind of the second step beyond that. Um, a person that acquired it from the person who, you know, the employee rightfully acquired it, passes it on to the third party. The third party knows it's a trade secret and uses it. They're still misappropriating the trade secret, even though they didn't necessarily have a duty to the party that created the trade secret to keep a secret, and even though they didn't do anything wrong in acquiring the information, but they know it's a trade secret and they acquired it from someone who had a duty to keep it confidential, that's a trade secret misappropriation. And then the final one here, this is sort of like the, um, sort of the clawback clause in, your, in, in discovery and litigation. Um, there was sort of there's a there's been a an accidental or a mistaken the disclosure of the trade secret you know someone attached something to an email they didn't mean to um, and so you know the party that came and acquired it that way once they know it was a mistake and they know it's a trade secret then they have a duty not to use it or disclose it. Um, now the um, that's only if they've not taken you know a material changed their position materially. So you know if someone accidentally passes on something that you know, indicates their business plans and the, the party receiving it sees oh they're gonna they're wanting to open up a new plant on this land I'm not gonna go ahead and buy that land and because uh, it's gonna be worth a lot of money. Uh, you know they could probably do that if they had some good faith reason to believe that they, the, the part of the sent them that information wasn't trying to keep it a secret. But if, if they know it's an accident, um, then, then they can't take advantage of it. Uh, so, you know, improper means is defined, right? It was, uh, you know, either it has to be acquired, being one of the ways it can be uh, trade secrets misappropriated is if the information is acquired by 
inappropriate means, um, you know, this lists some, you know, fairly specific ways uh, uh, of that occurring. The, the Uniform Co Act is maybe a little more broad and sort of having sort of a catch-all sort of, you know, or any sort of other improper means. Uh, but generally, sort of any, obviously anything criminal, anything devious, anything involving lying uh, is going to be considered uh, improper. And there, of course, you know, is and always has been uh, exception if you if you buy a product, uh, you know, in the open market and reverse engineer it, that's not that's not improper. That's a, that's permissible. Um, of course, if you think of it on your own, that's allowed. Um, that type of thing. Again, this is pretty similar to the substantive law it, under common law or the Uniform Act. Uh, the Act sets forth, uh, you know, specific remedies uh, that can be uh, awarded uh, in case there has been a, a misappropriation of trade secrets. Um, pretty much always going to be entitled, uh, very likely, uh, to be entitled to an injunction uh, to, you know, prevent further dissemination of the, uh, of the trade secret. So whatever, you know, to stop whatever action that's going on that's still misappropriating the trade secret, if, if it's still ongoing, you're going to be able to stop that. Uh, they can require affirmative actions, you know, in terms of, you know, requiring the, the infringer to, 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 to destroy, uh, Items that might embody the trade secret, or to return uh, return them to the uh, trade secret owner. Uh, so there's there's just kind of a lot a lot of power for the courts to craft whatever injunction they need to uh, to make the situation right. Um, in certain circumstances where you know maybe it's unfair to make the uh, party you know, completely stop. Uh, all use of the trade secret, uh, they can permit the continued use of the trade secret up only if the uh, party that's, in, that's infringing or misappropriating the trade secret agrees to pay a reasonable royalty. Um, uh, but that's, they can only require that reasonable royalty for so long as uh, the trade secret uh, can be protected. So, you know, there's sort of this concept in trade secret law that uh, eventually um, the public may figure it out through um, non-inappropriate means. Either, you know, they, someone's going to come up with, bound to come up with the same thing on their own, or, you know, by virtue of putting it out in the market, people are going to be able to reverse engineer it. So you're only entitled to sort of a head start. Uh, so that's sort of what they're talking about there for the uh, only as long as it could have been prohibited. Uh, the Federal Act does have some interesting provisions related to um, how employees get treated. And, you know, the the vast majority of cases, uh, I mean, I guess I know it's a statistic, but it seems to me the vast majority of these trade secret cases do involve um, employers going after former employees who have um, taken the information and then moved on. Um, so any sort of injunction that's entered against um, a person um, as a result of the, the trade secret misappropriation under the Defend Trade Secrets Act, um, can't completely uh, prevent the person from entering into a particular employment relationship. Um, it can place conditions on that relationship, like you can't work on this account or you can't do this type of work for that company, um, that type of stuff, but it can't completely bar uh, the, the employee-employer relationship. Um, and if it's going to place conditions on the employment in terms of, you know, what type of work you can do or what, 
clients you can work for. Uh, it can't just be based on, hey, look, this employee's got a lot of valuable knowledge, and it would be it would hurt me if they then took and used this to help my competitor with uh, with their business. Uh, there needs to be um, some evidence that that's that that's going to happen that the employee is going to use the information in that way in an inappropriate way um, and uh, even though there's a federal law to the extent the state you're in has even more restrictive rules on uh, how you can enjoin the employer employee relationship and limit that um, those local state laws uh, should be given effect um, per this act Um, of course, you can award uh, damages uh, for infringement, and the, the damages provisions follow pretty pretty closely with the Uniform uh, Trade Secret Act. Um, always entitled to actual damages that you can establish. Um, also entitled to disgorgement of unjust enrichment. Uh, so, to the extent uh, your actual damages aren't aren't as much as the uh, infringer was enriched. You're entitled to uh, uh, disgorge that that party of, of the full amount they were enriched uh, by virtue of the misappropriation. Um, in place of actual damages, you're you're entitled to, uh, if you prefer or if you're unable to show, establish uh, the damages, um, a reasonable royalty. Um, so that would be you know. Familiar with the, that's a concept that's familiar to patent lawyers. Um, you know, you look at you know how much money they're going to make on this. What are the going rates for similar things? What are the options? That sort of thing. And you know, what would if they had negotiated arm's length? What 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 would a reasonable royalty be for using this the technology involved in the trade secret? Um, if the in uh, Misappropriation is willful and malicious. Um, then the court can uh, um, include exemplary damages up to twice the amount of the actual damages, or not just actual damages, twice the amount of the damages. So that, that would apply to the unjust enrichment as well as the um, as a reasonable royalty. So they can you know bump that up, basically treble damages in the in the entire award if if it's willful and malicious. Uh, also, if it's willful and malicious, uh, the uh, the plaintiff uh, may be entitled to their reasonable attorney's fees. Um, and the reasonable attorney's fees can work both ways. So uh, if the plaintiff brings a bad faith uh, claim for misappropriation, uh, the defendant may be entitled to their reasonable attorney's fees as well. So that's, uh, you know, something to keep in mind. Um, and also there can be... Um, you know, if the, if the court enters an injunction, you know, stopping the infringement or the, the misappropriation, I should say, uh, it may there may come a time down the road again when this information is rightfully in the public through n you know no misappropriation, and in that case, it's appropriate for the uh, defendant to come back and bring a motion to have the injunction lifted. Uh, bad faith on either side related to such a motion, again, uh, can subject uh, them to having to pay the other side's reasonable attorney's fees. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more, a little bit more in detail about this, uh, the next point, but um, exemplary damages and attorney's fees may not be available in the employer-employee situation if in the uh, agreements that the employer has with the employee relating to, if there's written agreements relating to how to handle confidential information, if they've not uh, followed the notice provisions of the Defend Trade Se Secrets Act, which basically uh, requires uh, the employer to put something in there notifying these folks that, hey, if you're a whistleblower, you may be able to disclose some of these trade secrets. If they don't do that, then these exemplary damages and attorney's fees are not available. So the, the, this whistleblower immunity, uh, the as you might expect, and as sort of good public policy, um, if an employee 
forms of trade secrets, but they relate to something illegal uh, that that the um, that their employer is doing. Uh, they're not going to be held liable for disclosing those trade secrets uh, to the extent they need to, you know, in reporting the, the crime or the malfeasance uh, to the appropriate authorities, um, or in co you know, if uh, law enforcement has kind of sought them out and is is uh, investigating, uh, you know, they're allowed to uh, disclose those trade secrets uh, in that situation without. Uh, being liable for misappropriating them, um, and, and similarly, if you know if the employee gets fired for being a whistleblower and brings a lawsuit, an anti-retaliatory uh, lawsuit, uh, to the extent again needed, assuming they do things under seal and and, and handle it appropriately, uh, disclosing the trade secret in that situation is not um, is not trade sec secret misappropriation and, and will not subject the employee to liability. And that uh, relates to this, this, uh, this provision that I, that I mentioned earlier that, um, and this is in some ways maybe to me the most interesting or, or, or more the part about this law that sort of uh, raises some new issues that probably want to uh, look at and talk about with your clients. Um, and that is, um, in the employment agreement, in your new employment agreements, uh, there is now a duty to set forth um, a notice uh, that they have immunity uh, to disclose these trade secrets if they need to do so in a whistleblower type situation. Um, so it either needs to be direct notice or you can put in, a, if you've got a handbook or something that describes Here's how our company handles things when you think we're violating the law. You can put a reference in the contract to that, say, refer to the handbook to see how trade secret disclosure may be impacted by our company policies related to uh, how we handle when you think we're committing a crime. Um, again, if you don't, if that's not in there, and then you uh, sue the employee for trade secret misappropriation, again, you know, pretty high percentage of the trade secret misappropriation lawsuits are employer going after employee, even if it's got nothing to do with the whistleblowing, if they had that, that sort of contract and it does not include the, you know, this, this notice, uh, attorney's fees and exemplary damages are, are gone, not available. Now, it only applies to contracts that were entered into after the law went into effect May 11, 2016. There's no duty to go back and amend existing contracts, um, but it does apply if you, you know, update the contract. You know, if you amend it for something else, uh, it would apply to those. Um, and understand, employees got a pretty broad. Debt. It's an It's a defined term in the act, and, it, and it's, it's defined broadly. It includes contractors and consultants. So you're not getting out of it if you, you know, if it's a contractor that. That, that came in and then took your information and did something with it. You need that. You need that notice in that uh, agreement. Uh, three years. Three years stat statute limitations. Uh, same as the uh, Uniform Act, and same as the Uniform Act. Um, uh, continuing. Misappropriation constitutes a single act, so you know if it started more than three years ago and you should have known about it more than three years ago, the fact that it's still ongoing or was ongoing less than three years ago doesn't doesn't help you. Uh, in order to assert uh, the act, uh, the so it's got a three-year statute of limitations, so you, you know theoretically you could go back something that happened three years ago and get it, but you can't unless uh, the misappropriation has occurred uh, after the effective date, which is May 11, 2016. Now, unlike statute of limitations, though, if there's a continuing, if they've continued the misappropriation, even if it started before the act went into effect, if it continued until after, uh, you can still, uh, you can still bring, bring suit under this, under the federal act. 
so that kind of brings us to the the civil seizure, which was kind of the, as I said, sort of the the uh, the, the clause that got the most attention. It's the one. It's not nowhere to be found in you know the Uniform Act, and it was uh, you know kind of the thing that, that generated the most publicity and was a little bit scary or interesting. Um, and I'll kind of go over you know what's required, but I will also tell you in the year and a half that this has been going, there's only been one case that's a reported case anywhere where a court has been willing to to order the ex parte seizure. That's possible that there's been more civil seizure because it's possible there's been more than that because um, they try not to part of the. the uh, the procedure is is not publicizing it and not embarrassing the party against whom it's been done against. So some of these may be sealed and we can't see, there may be more of these that we just can't see, but there's a lot of them out there denying it and not very many uh, on record uh, granting it. Um, it's ex parte without notice to the other pa other side. Um, it does need to be based on, it can be based on the complaint itself if it's a verified complaint or you need to submit an affidavit uh, verifying the uh, you know the elements that that are going to be required to support it. Uh, so, uh, what are the requirements? Um, uh, the first one is that uh, a TRO or a preliminary injunction under Rule 65, just the standard uh, TRO, would not be adequate because the defendant would evade, avoid, or otherwise not comply. Um, so. You, you, uh, a lot of the courts have said that you know we're not going to go on to the civil seizure until we've given them a chance under this TRO to comply, because uh, otherwise, how do we know they wouldn't? Um, but there, but there can be factors I think where you know you just show look these guys have a history of not following the law. They don't care what they're not worried about contempt. You know we need to take action or something's going to happen. Uh, you have to show then kind of the. Uh, Similar factors for the, as you would have to show for a TRO or preliminary injunction. You know, immediate and irreparable injury uh, is going to occur if we don't make the seizure. That's maybe not so hard to show in trade secret case because, uh, you know, it's one of those things you can't unring the bell. Once the information's out there, it's no longer secret and it's lost a lot of its value. Uh, you got to show, you know, the balance of the harms, just like any other injunction. Uh, person whom you're seizing has the trade secret and has the property. Um, one of the, you know, one of the features of this procedure is you don't provide any notice to the other side. You, you know that you're having, you're considering that the court's considering it, or that it's coming. And so one of the factors you have to show is, look, if we gave them notice, uh, then they would evade it. Um, and then uh, the other thing is there was, there's a concern that um, folks would be using this to damage the reputation of the other party. Um, and so the, the applicant trying to get the seizure can't be, can't be out there uh, publicizing, hey, we're, we're gonna go get this seizure, we're gonna take this from them, or we have taken this from them, uh, can't be used as kind of a, a marketing, marketing tool. To make the other side look bad, uh, the court's required, uh, you know, once they seize this property, uh, to take specific steps to maintain the secrecy. I'm not going to go, you know, kind of into those, but it's got details about not making it available online and encrypting and all kinds of stuff. Uh, they're not supposed to allow the party requesting uh, the seizure to have access to the property after it's seized. It's supposed to be, you know, kept by the court. Um, you know, like a TRO or other injunction, uh, the party requesting the injunction uh, has to put up security in case it was wrongfully issued. Uh, and then within seven days of when they seize the property, then they give the other side a chance to come in and, and say why it was improper. Um, so that's, I'm going to turn now, maybe look at some of the cases that have uh, uh, have applied uh, the, the Defend Trade Secrets Act, and then maybe even move on to a few um, Iowa cases here if we've got 
we've got time. But uh, so this is the one case where the court actually did order uh, a civil seizure. Uh, the director of uh, equity finance for capital company. Uh, he was away from the company for a few weeks. They saw that he had downloaded their entire customer database that concerned them. And uh, he, he allowed them to inspect his, his home computer. And there they determined that uh, he did have it on there. He just, but he tried to hide it under um, funny names, different types of files. Uh, when they filed the complaint, they asked for a TRO that the court granted. Uh, requiring him to turn over his computer. He ignored uh, the, the TRO, didn't reply at all. Uh, he evaded service of the complaint and didn't, they, when they set the TRO, they set a, you know, for cause hearing date. So, you know, why, why should we not make this into a preliminary injunction? Didn't show up for that. Uh, so then the, you know, uh, the plaintiff asked for civil seizure and the, the court granted it, and uh, they showed up. Marshall showed up at his house while he was sleeping, knocked on the door, got the computer, uh, and, and took what they needed. Um, there were some irregularities in the way this was handled, though, and, and the court seemed to acknowledge it. Um, they um, requ required the other party to give notice uh, on this guy that there were seeking the civil seizure and that the marshals were coming. Um, and then after they have it, they, uh, after they uh, obtained the computer and the files, they, they gave them to, um, gave them to the plaintiff. Um, lawsuit just went away though. I think the, uh, a few weeks later, the defendants sort of capitulated and gave them everything. And so it, not much really happened there. Uh, so another uh, one of these cases that has looked at this act, um, the uh, the employer uh, in this case obtained a TRO uh, to get the employee's computer because they wanted to preserve the evidence. They were worried that the employee was going to erase a bunch of stuff and they wouldn't be able to make you know prove their case, prove what had happened. Uh, Unlike the last case, you know, the, the employer's lawyer showed up to fight this and at the initial hearing said, hey, look, no, you can't seize uh, his property uh, except under Rule 64, which deals with the seizure of property or the civil, seize, civil seizure procedures under the Defense Trade Secret Act, and they've not satisfied either of these. Um, uh, the court looked at it and said, no, that's not right. Rule 64... Uh, deals with seizure of property to secure a judgment. That's not what I'm doing here. We're seizing the property to preserve evidence. And the defend the DTSA doesn't didn't do away with their, my ability to seize property using TROs and preliminary injunction in these cases. It's just another way of doing it. And so you know they met the standard for TRO here, and that's uh, so it was appropriate. Um, this Via Technologies versus Asus computer uh, case from February. Um, the the plaintiff, uh, you know, I think it was actually the, the defendant. It was a cross complaint, but they sought to amend the complaint um, to add a claim under the uh, the DTSA, even though the the case had been filed in 2014, so it had been pending for a few years before uh, the act came into being. Um, and the deal was they, they learned through, you know, discovery that the, the actions they thought were trade secret misappropriation were continuing beyond uh, May 11th, 2016. So they wanted to add this federal cause. Uh, the court let them, said, yeah, uh, it's the way the statute's written and the way the other courts have interpreted it. If as long as the... Uh, Activity is continuing after, you know, beyond the date of May 11th. Uh, the DTSA applies, and it doesn't matter that it started before. Uh, one thing a little bit interesting here, you might con consider one in, one thing they argued is a distinction between the Uniform Trade Secret Act, at least in California, the way the California Act is written, and 
the federal act is that um, under California, the way it's written, it says uh, plaintiff's entire uh, court can award a reasonable royalty if the plaintiff can't establish damages or unjust enrichment. And from that they say, well, that, that means it's up to the court to award a reasonable royalty, whereas under the federal statute, all the uh, damages awards are under the same provision, and that's going to go to the jury. So they said there's a difference there. So that's something you may want to consider and weigh and whether or not, depending on where you are, there may be some chance that uh, there's a distinction in whether uh, certain issues are jury questions or questions for questions of law. Uh, Steves and Sons v. Jeldwen. Uh, Steves uh, contracted with a couple former Jeldwen employees or executives trying to get them to help them with their new uh, product line, how to make it, how to market it, that sort of stuff. Um, and they wanted to add in a complaint for conspiracy that these guys had conspired uh, to misappropriate trade secrets. And they, they wanted to they said that claim came under uh, 1832A5, which is the criminal uh, conspiracy statute under the trade, the trade secrets law. And their argument was, hey, look, the civil seizure section that, of this new DTSA uh, talks about being able to do it if they're, if they're conspiring to misappropriate a trade secret. That must mean there's a civil cause of action for conspiring to um, misappropriated trade secrets, so we've got this additional new cause of action we want to add. And the court said, no, um, it, the only civil cause of action is the one under 1836B for misappropriation. There's not a separate one for conspiracy. Nothing new was added in terms of that. Uh, right. About time for the next speaker. Okay, well, I kind of go, kind of, the, uh, I had some slides here that basically just kind of went through and showed how similar the um, Uniform Trade Secret Act is to the, the federal one. They, they kind of follow along pretty much uh, provision by provision. Um, we've got a couple state law cases here, but there's really nothing particularly interesting. They're just, they're not making really new law or anything like that. They're uh, just sort of reiterating uh, uh, various points, uh, but I kind of felt the need since I'm updating to show some of the recent cases. Um, again, from my perspective, the important part of the, the, the federal, the new Federal law, one, it gives you a, gives you a new uh, avenue into federal court without having diversity jurisdiction or some other ancillary jurisdiction. Uh, and it's got the new uh, provisions related to uh, giving notice to employees in your contracts that deal with confidential information that you want to consider. Otherwise, substantively, you know, everything's pretty much the same. Um, and the uh, civil seizure uh, remedy, very difficult to show, not that likely to be able to occur. So, otherwise, are there any questions?